All right, welcome everybody. Welcome to Regenerated Radio. This is the season premiere for season three of Regenerated Radio, and I am uh, just so honored and happy to have Dr. Sam Waldron here to kick things off with me. And uh, we're going to get to that in just a second. But before I do, a few bits of housekeeping. If you're watching on YouTube right now and you're not subscribed, we're really close to 200 subs. Doesn't really mean anything, but uh, you know that's fun. So let's get to the number and hit that subscribe button. I uh, appreciate you guys tuning in, uh, and if you like it as well. Really, the purpose of this podcast is to get all of these theological concepts, we try to bring them down to a lay level and then have uh, as broad of a reach as possible so that people can understand them uh, and then be edified by them. And the only way to get more broad reach is by playing the algorithm. So more subscriptions, more likes and all those things is always helpful. Uh, and so plus it's good encouragement for me to continue going. So <laughs> definitely uh, hit that. I appreciate you guys for watching and for waiting for just a couple minutes while we got through all the technical stuff that we needed to get through. And uh, I think that's all the housekeeping stuff. Their podcast form of this on Spotify will come out on Friday. So this is kind of a strange setup. You might notice that I'm not around my my PC and my general setup that I usually have. That's because I'm at a education technology conference in Dallas today. Uh, and that was not expected. So uh, that changed my plans just a little bit uh, for how we're going to get this done. And so that's why we're live streaming it. And it works out pretty well. So we're grateful for this kind of technology to be able to do this even from afar. So uh, with that, I'm going to bring in Dr. Waldron. Dr. Waldron, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. It's great to be with you today um, and uh, see you again, Greg. Yeah, absolutely. So before we get started, let me pray for us and then we'll talk about a couple of quick things before we jump into the main point of discussion today. So let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for, again, for technology, for the things that you've blessed us with so that we can have these, these conversations that would be hopefully edifying to the body, but also glorifying to you. God, would you help us to focus our hearts so that we are doing just that today in our conversation? Uh, Lord, would, we, would you help us to speak truth? Would you help us to speak from Scripture? Uh, and Lord, would you just be with us this afternoon? It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, Dr. Waldron, if you would just give us a quick biography of who you are. Um, I obviously, I'm, I'm really happy to have you on since you are the president of the seminary that I attend, but I'm, I'm sure you'll talk about that a little bit as well. <laughs> sure, yeah. Well, I am one of the pastors of Grace Reformed Baptist Church in Owensboro, Kentucky. Uh, and at the same time, I am president of Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary and uh, professor of systematic theology there. So if you come to the seminary and you uh, take courses, you'll probably get me for quite a few of those courses. I'm certainly not the only teacher or the, the teacher who teaches most things, actually. But uh, if you're taking systematics and usually historical theology, you'll probably have to deal with me. Yeah, I've already taken a couple of courses from you, and I've enjoyed them. The symbolics course, I can't recommend enough. Obviously, it's the one that we go in, right into the 1689 confession right when you first uh, start your coursework mm -hmm. and uh, you teach that and I benefited greatly from that so I appreciate it so beyond that uh, what are some maybe some published works some things even particularly on the subject of amillennialism I know you've done a lot of work in that field since we'll be talking about yeah. that a little bit today uh, published works and things like that that you do well uh, yeah I've been uh teaching eschatology now in one form or another in the seminary level since, uh, oh, the early 80s for about uh, 40 years now, I guess. Uh, but, uh, and so there are there are three books out there by me that are more particularly eschatological in character. Uh, end Times Made Simple, more of the End Times Made Simple. And then uh, I wrote a response uh, a number of years ago to uh, MacArthur's, uh, well, people describe it in different ways, but it's often called his outrageous sermon on why, which had the title, Why Every Calvinist Should Be Premillennial. And so I have a, a friendly response to MacArthur's Millennial Manifesto out there as well. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the book that uh, uh, you had to read for uh, your symbolics course is, of course, a modern exposition. Uh, that's now, I think, and it's... Uh, fifth or sixth printing. I'm, mm -hmm. uh, I think I have the sixth uh, edition, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and then uh, uh, Reformed Baptist Manifesto, uh, to be continued, is uh, my treatment of the uh, con uh, of continuationism. And uh, uh, I'm also one of the authors of a book called Who Runs the Church, published by Zondervan, 
which deals with uh, the issue of church government in a four view mm -hmm. kind of way. Yeah, I got that recently from a friend and noticed your name in there. And I, I started reading through it and getting your view against like Paige Patterson and some other yeah. folks that are in there. So uh, mm -hmm. that's really interesting. And of course, I take your view on that. So uh, anyway, a couple of quick side notes on that, by the way. I think it's a funny side notes. One of them, uh, I've been taking the biblical theology class with Dr. Barcelos, and uh -huh. uh, he he mistitled your second End Times Made Simple book and called it End Times Made Simpler, which I thought was funny. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it really wasn't the point. Anyway. <laughs> Even simpler. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes. Actually, you know, yeah, yeah that uh, that was an author's idea to call it that. And I don't know if it's been good or bad, but yeah, I, I have to live with it anyway. I think it's great. It, it For me, it seems to make it really um, easy to, well, I mean, obviously easy to understand. Well, that's what I was trying to do. Uh, so people have different opinions about whether I succeeded or not. You know? yeah, well, Hopefully the hopefully today's podcast will make it even simpler. -er. <laughs> and then the other funny note was uh, for those of you who are watching, we actually were intending to initially talk about Reformed Baptist ecclesiology today, uh, but so many of you reached out to me and said, "You, you why, don't, why don't you have him talking about amillennialism?" <laughs> that I decided to change the topic, and uh, Dr. Waldron was gracious enough to accommodate that. So thank you again. <laughs> Okay, well, let's jump into the topic then. Uh, we're going to start talking about uh, amillennialism. And so if you're watching and you're not sure what that means, you're not even sure really what eschatology means, we're going to start at a fairly ground level uh, yes. and give you a different uh, idea. So if, Dr. Waldron, if you would, would you just give us a little bit of a really brief, as as brief as you possibly can, yeah. uh, of an idea of the difference. I know that's a big task, <laughs> um, but the differences between the different millennial views, uh, yes. highlighting your own, obviously. Well, uh, actually, I commonly, when I teach the subject, I want to begin by saying that I think there are, are four orthodox views of eschatology. Mm -hmm. I don't by that, of course, mean that to, to say that they're, I think they're equally biblical, nor do I mean to say that I think certainly they're equally confessional, although I think three of them can fit into the uh, framework of the confession more easily than others. Uh, the, the prevailing view that we're, uh, we're so familiar with in our day is called dispensational premillennialism. It's the idea that God deals auto alternatingly in history with two different peoples of God. And uh, the Israel in the Old Testament period under the law, the church in the period of grace today, which is also uh, thought of as a great parenthesis in God's uh, dealings with Israel. And... Uh, and then at the uh, uh, in the future, God will get a, a, again begin to deal with uh, with national Israel again in a more specific way. Uh, this age ends for a dispensationalist with uh, the pre-tribulational and secret rapture of the church. Mm -hmm. Then the tribulation recommences. God's dealing with Israel. After seven years, Christ uh, comes in glory and uh, then takes up his earthly reign uh, on, uh, in our world for a thousand years before the final rebellion and then the, and the, then the, the destruction of evil and uh, the great right throne judgment and the eternal state. So, uh, that may seem a little complicated if you didn't grow up with it, know the system right. by the time you're 12, like I did. But uh, that's dispensational premillennialism. It's uh, one of two forms of premillennialism. Uh, another form of premillennialism is called historical or covenantal premillennialism. Uh, and this, this is different than dispensationalism because as opposed to dispensationalism, it does not... Uh, believe in uh, that um, that the church and Israel are two different peoples of God. It believes that the church is the new and true Israel of God. And because of that, it follows that there aren't, isn't going to be this two-stage second coming. And Christ is going to come again in glory. And uh, that will usher in uh, the millennium, which will be a period in which Christ reigns with his saints on earth, uh, and then after that millennium again, which is uh, which we call premillennial because Christ comes back 
pre or before it, uh, you have the eternal state. Um, right. Amillennialism, which uh, you've uh, told your hearers, or some of them at least that I hope. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I sort of spoiled the game there. <laughs> it's a much more, is a, is much simpler. It, it also uh, 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 teaches that the church is the new and true Israel of God. Uh, but uh, believes that this age is the uh, ultimate age in world history before the redemption of the world and the eternal state, so that at this, uh, so that this age ends with the second coming of Christ and uh, the general judgment, and this issues in uh, ushers in the eternal state, uh, which is uh, uh, something that takes place. Uh, which involves the redemption of the world, the recreation uh, of, uh, of, of the world as Christ's inheritance, uh, and the eternal dwelling place of, of Christ with his people. Um, Postmillennialism is very similar. Uh, in a sense, amillennialism is a form of postmillennialism. Um, in another sense, it's not. But Amillennialism and postmillennialism both believe that Christ comes back after the millennium. But this is where we get into some terminological things because the term millennium has both, I, I tell my students, a denotation and a connotation. The denotation is that it's a reference to a thousand years. Now, uh, both amillennialists and postmillennialists. Uh, probably take that thousand years as symbolic of a long period of time, an age-long period of time. But at the same time, uh, uh, amillennialists uh, simply think of it as, as the period of the gospel age, whereas post-millennialists, along with premillennialists, think of millennium in terms of the connotation of the word, which is that it's a great golden age of peace, righteousness, and prosperity. So, uh, at that point, then, uh, you have the difference uh, between postmillennialism and amillennialism that uh, uh, amillennialists don't believe in a great golden age of peace, righteousness, and prosperity on earth right. prior to uh, the uh, second coming of Christ. Uh, they, uh, uh, but postmillennialists do believe in that, and they believe that prior to Christ coming back, and there are differences of opinion about how it happens. But prior to Christ coming back, a long period of peace, righteousness, and prosperity under the spiritual reign of Christ uh, takes place here on earth. Christ isn't literally reigning on earth, but uh, the spiritual reign of Christ through the gospel brings about this long millennial golden age. Great. So that's a really good survey of, of all four uh, in a pretty short amount of time. So well done. I would not be able to do that effectively. So I appreciate it. Uh, okay. So as with anything, I think whenever you're kind of expounding on some particular topic within scripture, uh, you need a like a prolegomena of sorts. Uh, our, so my, my question, I think, to begin with, now that we have sort of a layout of what those four views are and, and understanding that there is a variety of, like you say, orthodox opinions uh, on this, what do you think would be the best sort of presuppositions that we need to take into uh, reading Revelation and reading other eschatological passage passages uh, of Scripture? What are some of the things that we need to have in mind when we come to those um, that might inform where we land in those four uh, camps? Well, certainly, uh, as with almost every doctrine, I suppose, it's a matter of what hermeneutics you bring into the issue. Right. Um and um, amillennialist, uh, and and to some degree, um, but I think amillennialists are the most. Um, what's the word I want? Consistent here, mm -hmm. they uh, believe that we have to understand, uh, especially passages that deserve the description apocalyptic or prophetic, often in a in a highly figurative fashion. And so they're ready to uh, to uh, to see and to interpret uh, the Book of Revelation as a as a highly figurative or dramatically figurative kind of thing. It is uh, uh, it is a um, 
uh, a, a figurative depiction of, of this gospel age. Right. So, um, and, and, to, and to different degrees, at the other end of the spectrum, as I'm sure dispensationalism, uh, you're going to hear, as I heard often, that the Bible must be interpreted literally, mm -hmm. uh, or at least literally wherever possible. And so they're going to be very uncomfortable uh, with the amillennial emphasis on the fact that uh, much of uh, what we read of in the book of Revelation, and it's, uh, it's not all or nothing for anybody, but much of what we read of in the book of Revelation, other passages like Daniel, other prophetic passages of the Old Testament, is intended figuratively and must be interpreted according to those those canons of hermeneutics that enable us to make sense of biblical of uh, a uh, biblical figurative language and there's much that can be said about that on the other hand dispensationalists while they may ad admit that there's an occasional figure of speech in the book of revelation are going to be are going to have the emphasis on it being uh, much more literal in character probably the uh, best illustration that'll give your listeners uh, a handle on this is is to say that uh, uh, Revelation 20, the key passage in this whole discussion about mm -hmm. millennial views, Revelation 20, according to all millennialists, must be interpreted in, in a, a more figurative fashion. That is to say, when we read of the dragon, when we read of the uh, chain and the key uh, uh, and the thousand years, the amillennialist is going to be committed to the idea that we have to be consistently figurative in the way we interpret those things, uh, even up to and including the thousand years being a figurative period of time uh, in, which uh, symbolizes the present gospel age and is not intended as a literal thousand year period, but uh, as a figure of speech that speaks of a long age uh uh, or period of time. So, but the amillennialist is going to argue, look, you can't, you can't take, uh, when, when Satan is bound there in Revelation 20, nobody mm -hmm. think this, thinks there's a little or literal chain, and no one thinks that there's a literal key, and no one thinks that there's a literal prison with brick walls <laughs> uh, keep in, and bars keeping Satan in. We all know he's a, he's a spirit. And, and so for that very reason, since the prison key and the prison itself and the prison chain uh, are all figurative, so also the thousand years, the prison sentence must be taken figuratively as well. And so we take the language of Satan being bound and Satan being loosed as referring uh, not to some complete uh, uh, locking away of Satan so that he can't do anything in the world. We take it as referring to some sort of uh, way in which he is greatly restrained in the world from accomplishing his purposes. It uh, gets into the whole interpretation of Revelation 20. But that may give your listeners a sense of the difference, uh, the difference uh, of opinion that amillennialists have with regard to how uh, prophetic language should be interpreted. Right. I th that's actually really important, uh, in my opinion, because of my experience in talking with I mean, even my, my mother, I mean, we were, I was raised in a dispensational Baptist setting as well. And so, you know, we have these conversations all the time um, and I haven't quite convinced her yet, <laughs> uh, but we, we get to have those conversations. And I think that uh, Riddlebarger was really helpful here. You know, there's yeah. several big names uh, with, with, along with yourself, Kim Riddlebarger and uh, Sam Storms have written incredible works on amillennialism. And right. Riddlebarger, in the very beginning, he talks about the same idea of the hermeneutic. Uh, the idea that they have is that they have a very little literal hermeneutic and they're taking passages literally, but he yeah. reframes that to literalistic where we're, we're you're reading a, a literal hermeneutic onto texts that are not actually literally written uh, in that way. And so I think that that's interesting uh, and a really good, helpful point to begin with for sure. Well, and, and I always quote R.C. Patrol who insists on the fact that reformed hermeneutics has to engage in, uh, in a, a literary genre analysis. We have to we have to make up our minds, and there are clear biblical uh, principles that allow us to do this. We have to make up our minds uh, how the Bible intends uh, 
uh, the literature before us. Is the literature before us uh, narrative, historical, poetic, or is it figurative and apocalyptic? And, and that decision must dictate then uh, our, our major way of, of uh, understanding the language. There is another thing besides hermeneutics here that I think uh, deserves just a little conversation. And that is that both with regard to the book of Daniel and Revelation particularly, there are, are several different um, I suppose they have hermeneutical foundations, but there are several different uh, uh, mindsets that people bring to the book of Revelation. Uh, the, uh, those mindsets, I guess, can be described as the, uh, the futurist mindset, mm -hmm. which, takes, uh, which approaches the book of Revelation as basically talking about future events. Uh, the preterist mindset, which basically takes the book of Revelation of talking about events that have, uh, that took place prior to and leading up to the destruction of the Jerusalem in AD 70. Right. Uh, there is the historicist mindset, which basically sees the book of Revelation of, as giving us a symbolic but consecutive chronological history of the, of the present age and the future. Uh, and this was very common uh, among even some of the ref some of the reformers uh, centuries ago, uh, and and uh, I hold along with uh, G. K. Beale. In fact, I borrowed the the terminology from him in order to find an adequate description of my own approach. Uh, the the more idealist point of view, which right. sees uh, which sees the Book of Revelation from a redemptive historical modified idealist perspective as giving us um, uh, a view of the gospel age, which kind of recapitulates uh, uh, several times through the book of Revelation and, and, and shows us that this period of time uh, with an increasing focus on the end of that period of time uh, uh, in, in the great symbols we have. So it, it doesn't see it as a consecutive chron chronology of history. He doesn't see it as dealing with primarily events that took place in the past, the preterist view. He doesn't see it as primarily taking uh, uh, focusing on things that take place in a future tribulation and millennium, but things that take place in this gospel age, but looked at from different points of view with an increasing focus on the end of this age. Right, okay, great. Yeah, and I've heard that term, that idealism term, thrown around a lot as well. Um, we actually just finished not too long ago a um, a study on end times at my church. And not, I didn't run it, run it, but my pastor did, and he. I was the first time I'd ever ever heard that term idealist, but I think it it does fit well. And even the whole idea of um, sort of the the repeating pattern of revelation. Uh, mm -hmm. If you want to speak to that a little bit as well, maybe you can kind of, yeah, give us an insight yeah. into what that means. <laughs> well, uh, you know. Uh, of course, Beale's uh, works on the Book of Revelation, Greg Beale's works, are, are really beyond all praise. But uh, of the uh, of the book that may be more accessible uh, to a lot, and, and it's certainly been very popular, uh, that uh, that uses what we've called the redemptive historical modified idealist view, with the idea of recapitulating patterns in the Book of Revelation, right. is William Hendrickson's More Than Conquerors which is a, a wonderfully simple treatment of the book of Revelation, uh, which follows this idea that it, it recapitulates different views of the gospel age over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting once you've heard that to go back and read Revelation, because then you, you do, I think you do see it. It seems pretty clear to me, but uh, it does take somebody pointing out that view <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. Uh, well, it's, sense. Well, yeah. It's uh, I guess it's, natural I, I don't know if i want to use that word but it's it's kind of like the uh um uh, assumption of uh i don't want to say immature mind but it's kind of uh, it's easy to come to uh, to to read the book as if it's the book of revelations that starts at the beginning of the, of of the age and it goes right through the future in a, in a, in a kind of linear pattern whereas 
uh, when it's actually studied, you realize that doesn't work because you get up to the, uh, the end of the age and then it goes back to the beginning of the age. And you see particularly that pattern about probably uh, the most definitive exhibition of that pattern of coming to the end of the age and then going back to the beginning in uh, Revelation 11, which brings you to the general judgment of the end of the age. And then Revelation 12 goes back to the birth of the Messiah. So unless you think the birth of the Messiah is going to take place again after after the general judgment, you have to have some idea of recapitulation here. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so with that in mind, now with the prolegomena or the principles of hermeneutics that we need to understand out of the way, uh, mm -hmm. what are some of the, the most important biblical passages that you see? Why, why is amillennialism preferred to kind of collate all that data into oh. one system? How does that work so well? Um, well, uh, I, 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 I think that there are basically three simple arguments a millennialism that uh, can be brought forward. The first, the first of these arguments, um, although I deal with another one first in my book, but the first of these arguments, and, and perhaps the most simple, is simply this. Uh, there's going to be, the Bible teaches that there's going to be a general judgment at Christ's second coming involving all men living and dead and issuing in the eternal state. Uh, and and I, I look uh, in... Uh, End times made simple at Romans 2 and Matthew 25 and 2 Peter 3. You could turn to many other passages, actually. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mentioned seven in a modern exposition in chapter 32. But at any rate, uh, and all those passages teach that at Christ's second coming, there's going to be a general judgment of all men living and dead, and it, which issues in the eternal state. This is the teaching of Matthew 25. Uh, Christ is going to come in his glory. All nations are going to be gathered before him. He's going to judge the sheep and the goats. And Matthew 25, 46 ends uh, that the goats go away into eternal punishment and the sheep go away into, the, into eternal life. There it is. Now, if that doctrine is true, uh, and it's the doctrine of the, uh, that uh, uh, is most easily seen in the confession, if that doctrine is true, then the notion of a millennium in the future in which people are living and dying and and, and uh, unresurrected and resurrected men are living together in a millennial period of time, having babies, at the end of which there's this great rebellion, uh, that notion simply doesn't uh, hold water. It doesn't, it is not consistent. It is absolutely inconsistent with the notion of a, of a general judgment at Christ's second coming. Uh, you have to begin to parse this judgment out. You have to begin to uh, divide it into all sorts of mini judgment or a whole program of judgment. And that's the only way to save dispensationalism. And I don't think that uh, parsing it out into a whole program of judgments can, uh, can be made to make sense with regard to Matthew 25, Romans 2, uh, uh, or 2 Peter 3, or, or many other passages in the New Testament. But another passage that uh, uh, you mentioned in uh, the outline you sent me is, is Luke chapter 20. And this is the notion that the New Testament teaches that there are two ages, the present natural age and the future a supernatural age. Maybe I should just read the uh, three key verses out of Luke 20. Of course, yeah. the broader context here is Jesus of a dispute with the Sadducees about the resurrection. And of course, his major purpose is to defend the doctrine of the resurrection. But uh, verses 34 to 36 uh, divide all of history into two ages and in a way that is utterly inconsistent with premillennialism, I think, and, and only consistent with amillennialism. Uh, Jesus said to them, verse 34, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot even die anymore because they are like angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. Now, there are four clear contrasts between 
of this age and of the age to come in this passage. And of course, this language occurs many, many times in the New Testament. But uh, Jesus teaches that in this age, people marry and are given in marriage. In the age to come, they don't marry, nor are they given in marriage. So it's a, it's a completely different uh, uh, period of time uh, with completely different kind of people there. Right. Uh, Jesus teaches that in this age, people, there is death and dying. But in the age to come, they cannot even die anymore, he says. So this age, death and dying. In the age to come, no death and dying. Uh, then he teaches that uh, in this age, people are in a natural condition. That's already implied by the fact that they marry and that they are, are, are uh, subject to death and dying. But in the age to come, uh, there are uh, those who would have at that age are characterized by having received the resurrection from the dead and being sons of the resurrection, verse 36. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have the contrast between natural men and now in this age and resurrected men in the age to come. And finally, Jesus makes it clear that in the age to come, that is to say the future age of this world, there are, are only righteous men. Uh, he speaks of those who are considered worthy to attain to that age. He speaks, uh, speaks of uh, their, their being sons of God. And so uh, here you have two ages, very different in character. And uh, it's clear that the, the dividing line between these two ages is the resurrection. And the whole New Testament makes clear, I, I, I speak... Uh, I am. I don't think I'm. Uh, I'm uh, exaggerating at all. The whole New Testament makes clear that the resurrection of God's people occurs at Christ's second coming. That's First Thessalonians four. It's First uh, Corinthians fifteen. It's twenty other passages. Right. And so uh, the the dividing line between this age and the age to come is the second coming of Christ, and in the age to come, there's no place for. The millennium interpreted in the way that premillennialists interpretate Revelation 20, because in Revelation 20, in that millennium, wait, the way they interpret it, you have people marrying, you have people dying, you have you have people who are not resurrected from the dead, and you certainly have wicked people at the end of the millennium rebelling against Christ. And so, uh, uh, again, uh, in neither dispensational nor historic premillennialism uh, fit in. To the the two age doctrine taught here by Christ, if it's taken seriously uh, at all, the uh, the the third argument is has to do with the whole doctrine of the kingdom in the New Testament and and the doctrine of the two two uh, stage coming of the kingdom, and that I think is another a major New Testament uh, uh, datum that leads directly to amillennialism. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I was like, I was thinking that while you were going through that entire part about the two age and age to come, just that we we accept that doctrine of living in the already and not yet kind of dichotomy for so many other things that it seems yeah. just natural for me to, at least for me, to apply that to a millennial eschatology as well. Uh, and so I'm not, I'm not sure <laughs> how you reconcile that from the other side. And I think it would be interesting, actually, uh, even here in the, on the screen, <laughs> somebody mentioned, I'd love to see a debate or discussion between Sam Waldron and John MacArthur on this topic. You've done some asynchronous work. So, yeah, that may, that may be an interesting uh, thing to pull up sometimes if we can get you guys in a room together <laughs> or in a Zoom room. Here we go. Lots of luck getting that. No. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I don't think that that would have uh, quite the success. Yeah, in, uh, you know, I'm, him. I'm not a big one for debates. I know people love them, and I've done it a few times. But um, sometimes I think debates are more more about winning than getting the getting the truth right. But anyway, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just had my first debate on this channel. It was not something I ever intended to do, but I just had such good conversations with both Time and Klein and Tom Hicks on yeah. political. Uh, theology and things like that yeah. and so it, it worked out it, of course they're so friendly toward each other that that's that's the kind of spirit that i would like to see in debates more anyway yeah anyway we're getting off track <laughs> yeah, yeah there was uh, for your listeners interest i was i was in uh it was more like a symposium uh there's another word that's eluding me right now 
like a round table. Uh, Jim Hamilton and uh, Gary DeMar and myself representing three the three different millennial mm-hmm. views. And uh, that was interesting. And it did have more of a collegial atmosphere to it, although uh, the pre-millennialists and the post-millennialists tended to be tend to be arguing with each other and kind of ignoring me, but <laughs> that, that was all right. I didn't mind. You know, I, I think kind of a legendary video on YouTube now as well as um, hopefully I can't hear my phone beeping over and over <laughs> um, is the video that um, John Piper has put out with the evening of eschatology with Dr. Oh. Hamilton and Doug Wilson and Sam Storms. Yeah. And it's similar to that where I think that the pre-mill and post-mill sort of argue a lot. Although there's a good bit of jibing between the uh, between Sam and Jim as well. <laughs> yes. That would be a good to view. Okay, so a couple of other things. I actually have some questions that have come in, so I do want to address those. Uh, before I do, though, uh, the, the main thing that I want to get to on that outline, kind of since we're, we're going to be a little pressed for time, if I do questions as well. So the main thing I want to get to on that outline, and it actually does answer one of the questions, uh, is what are some of the sort of practical implications of understanding eschatology in the way that we have understood it? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's a great question. I, I really think that it it helps us to uh, uh, understand the importance of the Church of Christ in its present manifestation in God's uh, eternal plans. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are those, and Amillennialists believe this uh, uh, very strongly, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Right. The Church is God's plan for spreading the gospel throughout the world and in that sense rede- uh, the redemption of the world. That's that's his plan. The plan to spread the gospel and for Christ's kingdom to come is in a future millennium. It's, it's the church. It's the church of Christ preaching the gospel of Christ. And um, the church doesn't share the stage with another people of God. The church is the new, the true, the reformed Israel of God. And uh, I think one of the great implications of amillennialism uh, is that it should make us uh, really uh, solid, uh, consistent uh, churchmen because uh, we see uh, the church as the uh, movement, the organization, the institution uh, which God has planted in the world to take the gospel to all the nations and and in that way to see a multitude whom no man can number redeemed. So uh, I, I think that's one of the important things. Another of the important things I would say is to, is to deliver us from distractions. I mm-hmm. mean, um, yes. <laughs> it's a horrible distraction when people, and they think about uh, biblical prophecy, all they can think is, uh, of is about the uh, nation state of Israel in, right. in, the, uh, uh, in, the, in what is in Palestine as supposedly the center of God's purposes in the world. What a bunch of nonsense. <laughs> uh, the, uh, <laughs> uh, when, God, when the Bible asks us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, it's, ta- it's telling us to pray for the peace of the heavenly and the new and, and uh, Jerusalem. And his present manifestation is the Church of Christ on Earth, mm-hmm. and uh, 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 and all of all of the effort, all of the emotion expended about what's going on in the Promised Land, will the Temple there get rebuilt, and all of that stuff has really nothing to do with the eschatology of the Bible, and especially of the New Testament. Right. And for people who are viewing that know me a little bit more than uh, some of the extra work that I do, I work for my father-in-law's ministry called Christian Witness to Israel. Uh, and it is a very much a reformed um, point of view as far as, as, far as their, uh, their theology. And so it's probably one of the only, if not the only organization out there that has that as its purpose to minister to Jewish people um, in order to win them to Christ rather than to, you know, bring about the millennium or something, you know, try to try to do it by man's earthly means. And I think that that's a, it's a good and um, right endeavor. And uh, I do think that we see that twisted a lot. So what you say there about distractions is true and very important. Um, and yeah, I agree entirely. Like I, I see 
whenever I read things now, I'm, I'm not, from a millennial perspective, um, I'm not trying to pick it apart to say, okay, what's going to happen? It's it's more, what is this telling me about, about Christ? What is this telling me about how I can now uh, expand his kingdom on the earth for, uh, for that to eventually be fulfilled? And so I think it's just, it's a much more, dare I say, healthy mindset <laughs> to read scripture. Well, I certainly think so. And uh, I mean, that's another thing you could talk about. There's so much sensationalism mm. in the prevailing dispensationalism that, uh, frankly, I don't think is healthy. And I think that amillennialism is a, uh, has a much more practical focus to it uh, than the sensationalism and fascination with events in the Middle East and, and all sorts of other things that has really very little to do with the Christian life. And I think it's why many people have kind of turned off prophecy uh, in their lives. They've turned it off because they associate it with that kind of, well, almost useless sensationalism. Hmm. And they want something more practical. Well, I'm here to say that eschatology is practical, but I agree, I agree that that kind of eschatology doesn't have a lot of practicality to it. Right. Okay, well, we've gone through sort of a prolegomena and a, a way of talking about hermeneutics and making sure that we're reading correctly. We've gone through sort of, in case you, by the way, in case you are questioning whether or not I'm learning anything in seminary, <laughs> we've gone through a prolegomena and now some excursies and That's talking about uh, the scripture itself and how it's supported. Well, let's give some examples of the whole because uh, I have some questions here that are directly related to that. So just taking a few different concepts within Revelation or a couple of different concepts within Revelation that people, uh, really one person has asked about, but they're great questions, ones that I would like to know the answer to as well. Uh, the first one, I'm not going to be able to pull out because it's a question that I just want to uh, ask from the perspective of, again, my mother who uh, would love to ask somebody who is an expert in this question. What do you make of the the idea of the 70 weeks of Daniel? Um, and how does the amillennialist interpret those that the time frames or however you would <laughs> change that? Well, I've got, uh, that's, that's a great question. Uh, I wish I had a definitive answer about it because uh, I, I have been, uh, I've never been, I was sort of taught the typical dispensational view that yet, the uh, captivity of Israel, and then uh, the restoration, and then 69 weeks. And then there's this great parenthesis between the 69th and the 70th week. And that then that's the seven-year tribulation. By the way, that's the whole biblical basis in dispensationalism for a seven-year tribulation, right. uh, that, that supposedly future 70th week of Daniel. Um, I, I'm quite sure that that uh, that view is wrong the whole parenthesis theory has nothing to support it especially once you get rid of the church israel distinction but uh, uh i i'm i'm also pretty confident that the passage has to do with mainly to do with the prediction of the uh coming uh and of the messiah but once you get down into the details of what is uh, what is this week and halfway through the week and all of that? Quite honestly, I I wish I knew uh, <laughs> because <laughs> uh, the uh, uh, I mean I have I have some theories about it, but um, nothing that really satisfies me. And um, you know, uh, I think that the the years uh, the days are uh, seventy weeks of days are intended as years. But boy, it's it's difficult to make that sense make sense chronologically, and then you have the you have the question of what is the seventieth week? Uh, I I think there's a lot a lot uh, of attractiveness in the idea that the first half of the seventieth week there was a three and a half year ministry of Christ, um, but what's the second half of the three and a half? Your uh, uh, second, the second half of the seventieth week, or the second three and a half years. Uh, some people have said it was the preaching of the gospel to Israel, and up until the stoning of Stephen, about three years later, uh, mm -hmm. maybe that's true. Uh, I, I tend to think that maybe uh, something that that second three and a half may be a figure, maybe uh, figurative, but. It's uh, 
I hesitate at that. Uh, so you're seeing how little I know about this, but I hesitate, <laughs> I hesitate at that. There, there'd be a lot to uh, persuade me that the second three and a half years is a figurative period of time for this entire gospel age, uh, looked at as a period of tribulation for God's people. Uh, and there might be some things in the book of Revelation that might lead me in that direction. But quite honestly, uh, one of the things that maybe when I get really old and retire, I'll do, I'll, I'll do is go back and study uh, Daniel 70 weeks and see if I can make any more sense of, of them than I have already. <laughs> I mean, I do. I do expect uh, I, I've seen uh, light come to my mind uh, in terms of proper interpretations of the Bible with passages that really confused me in the past. And now I think I understand. So maybe God will give me more light about the 70 weeks of Daniel in the future, too. Maybe so. Although I think uh, my buddy Fuzz here brings up a good point. He says, utilizing an unclear text of the week of, weeks of Daniel over Matthew 24 and 25 is something many, many do. And it is sad. Um, we, our hermeneutical principle, one of our main, our primary hermeneutical principles is that we interpret the clear text in light of, or unclear well, text in light of the clear text. And we interpret the Old Testament in light of the New Testament. Right. And, uh I guess this is maybe why I come off as a little flippant about some of these Old Testament passages. I don't mean to be flippant about the interpretation of the Bible, but the fact of the matter is that you're dealing uh, there in the Old Testament not only with, I think, highly figurative, uh, especially in the book of Daniel, highly figurative passages, but you're also dealing with the whole flattened prophetic perspective. Uh, it's, I think it's absolutely clear that you had had this flat prophetic perspective that characterized the prophets of the Old Testament. What they said was right, that they didn't have any death perception right, in yeah. terms of uh, the order of events and what might occur between the foothills and the higher mountains and back. Mm -hmm. And and so um, I, that makes me pretty, pretty satisfied to go to the New Testament and say, uh, what does the New Testament say about the interpretation of these passages? And oh, maybe maybe at least with old these Old Testament passages, uh, we can talk about how the kingdom predicted there unfolds in two stages. And I think that actually is the case in the book of Daniel with regard to Daniel two and seven. Right. I'm I'm glad you mentioned the foothills and mountains thing because I was about to bring it up, but it must have been it must have been in your uh, intro to systematics course that I heard that because <laughs> it stuck in my head. <laughs> okay. So a couple of other quick examples we'll try to get through um, before we jump in to, or before we close out here. Um, like I said, examples of the whole questions that people have specifically about various things that are interpretive uh, questions. So this one is from D who asks, who are the two witnesses in Revelation 11? And how is that viewed through the odd mill sense? Of course, that's a well, very I, common question, but I like it. Yeah, my, my best guess is that the two witnesses are symbolic of the church. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> uh, and, uh, that's the way Hendrickson takes them in uh, his commentary. Uh, I I do think that you have a, you have a very, you know, and... Um, I, I say this modestly and without a lot of dogmatism, but I, one thing that is clear to me is that you have a, a very similar structure uh, of, of time in Revelation uh, 11 with regard to the two witnesses as you have in Revelation 20. You have the two witnesses witnessing for, what is it, 1,360 days, then, there, then the persecution leaves their dead bodies in the street for three and a half days. Mm -hmm. and then the, then God raises them up and, uh, uh, and there's, and there's judgment that comes on the wicked. Well, you have the, you have the thousand years, the little period, and then the judgment at the end of the little period in revelation 20, just like you have the restraining of the mystery of iniquity. And then uh, the apostasy and the revelation of the man of sin in second Thessalonians two, and then the destruction of the of the man of lawlessness in Revelation two. So you have this long period of time of of uh, gospel witness. You have the short period of time of a concentrated tribulation for uh, the church, and then you have God intervening at the end of history and judgment. I mean, those those things are so similar that 
that creates a very attractive viewpoint uh, mm -hmm. in terms of my understanding of Revelation 11. And uh, I think they have to be taken figuratively. Yeah, I agree. I had a long conversation with a couple of folks about that a while back who uh, I, I think the, the two witnesses and this maybe this is me. You can correct me if I'm just saying absolutely crazy things here. But uh, the two witness idea of, of Christ tells them to go out in pairs and goes out yeah. and anytime you see anyone going out into the world for the most part they're doing that in pairs uh, and so it just seems to be yeah. kind of a continuation of that theme well sure and and i can you connect it to the fact that every fact is confirmed by two or three witnesses right yes yeah good okay so that's one we'll do one more question like that and then we'll move out of the interpretive stuff uh and then try to wrap up here so the other one, and also comes from D, he says, how can, this is a common, very common uh, question that the yeah. millennialists will get from uh, particularly dispensational premillennialists, but how can per scripture Satan be walking the earth, seeking who he can devour, also be in heaven, being the great accuser, and be currently bound in prison? <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that is a great question. I And I think the only way to come to a solution uh, to bring those three things together is to understand the language of Revelation 20 figuratively. Yeah. Here's the point. Um, uh, and uh, when I teach on the subject, I kind of call it the Narnia principle because mm -hmm. uh, we have to take everything that uh, Revelation 20 and other uh, apocalyptic passages, we have to take them through the, uh, the wardrobe uh, and uh, to see what they mean in the real world where we live. I mean, the fact of the matter is, uh, I, I'm going to state this really strongly because I think people need to hear it really strongly. You know, there is no dragon in this world. <laughs> There's no great serpent. That dragon and the great serpent uh, about which Revelation 20 is speaking exists, exists only in the world of vision. And you can't bring them into this world by uh, like cutting them out of, of a comic book and pasting them into the real world in which we live. They are symbolic, apocalyptic, visionary creatures. They mean something in our world, of course, but you can't you can't simply you know bring them straight in. They've got they've got to go through the wardrobe, right? Right. Um, and so similarly. When, when we when we think of the language of Satan being bound, we are not obliged to take that kind of uh, clearly figurative language and uh, and make it mean anything we wish. Uh, Satan is bound in the visionary world. Now that means something in our world, but uh, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that he's rendered completely inact inactive. Uh, lying there in chains in the abyss and not able to do anything in our world. It's clear, and in fact, if you ask the question of Revelation 20, what is it that Satan isn't able to do? You get an answer to it when you see what he does do when he's released. He gathers the nations of, uh, in a global attack of the church. How is Satan bound now? He is unable to, uh, to stop the missionary outreach of the church. He's unable to stop the gospel outreach of the church throughout the world. Uh, and uh, when he is loosed, that is exactly what he will do. He'll bring about global persecution of the church. And to refer back to Revelation 11, the uh, missionary witness of the church will lie in the streets dead for three and a half days. Hmm. But, uh, but to uh, take that language and then say, well, then it's, he's completely inactive. Uh, in our age, can't do anything. That's what that's what it means is to is to blow way out of proportion uh, figurative language that has a different function and meaning in that passage. Yeah. Okay. I, I like that. That's a good. Uh, that's a good. It kind of brings it back to the whole hermeneutical principles we talked about at the beginning. That's right. That's right. Uh, you that know, and, and just to add, when uh, let, let me put the shoe on the other foot, um, mm -hmm. when the book of, when Revelation 20 predicts the binding of Satan, that has to, one of the principles that has to be followed is what does uh, what is how is this consistent with the rest of the Bible? What does the rest of the Bible say about the binding of Satan? 
Does the rest of the Bible ever teach a future interim a binding of Satan? You know what the answer to that question is? It never does. But there are at least seven major passages in the New Testament that teach that Satan was bound or restrained in an important sense by the events of Christ's first advent. There is absolutely zero evidence any place else in the Bible for a future binding of Satan, of, yeah. uh, of the like of which Revelation 20 teaches. That's a good point. Okay, so I'm going to ask one more question, just sort of a practical, and to bring it from the, the we're, you know, we're talking about the differences between people to more of a unified question. And this is from Father Ironheart, who asks, can pastors who shepherd the same church differ in this area? One being just be pre mill and one ah mill, for example, uh, since especially since we've kind of put those two in juxtaposition against each other, can they work together without confusing the sheep? Hmm. Hmm. Well, I, I'm I'm thankful I've never had to try to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, have, we have Father Ironheart is a friend of mine, and he and I uh, have uh, a friend who is in that situation. <laughs> I mean, on the one hand, let me say, I I think that. Uh, I meant what I said earlier, that I think each of the four views we've talked about are generally within the bounds of orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, I do think that if it were, if it were up to me, and pe people could be submissive uh, to uh, the teaching of the church and sweet and peaceable, I could probably allow a dispensationalist to be a member of my church. Uh, only... But having said that, um, uh, I'm not sure how well it's going to work. But uh, uh, and, and I certainly have to say, I don't think that dispensationalism is confessional. Right. And, and so I'd be letting the person in on the on the basis that they have to submit to the confession, even though they don't completely agree with it. And we'd have to have some very long discussions to see if they could really be happy and not get really upset when yeah. the other view is taught. Uh, the confessional view is taught from the pulpit of the church. So, um, but having said that, I do think that uh, uh, both postmillennialism and historic premillennialism are more consistent, although I have to swallow hard when I, I talk about historic premillennialism <laughs> being consistent with the confession. I, I'm not sure how some of those guys back there signed the confession and were still premillennial, but... Um, I'm I'm willing to admit that covenant premillennialism, postmillennialism, amillennialism are all consistent with the confession. But um, boy, uh, when you when you come when you come to the eldership of the church, uh, you really need unity. And uh, I think I think it probably could be done between a a, a historic premill, amill, and postmill. I'm just glad I don't have to do it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I think on, on most issues, uh, the, uh, all three of those views can hold the, the confession and teach the confession. And uh, and so I, I suppose it could be done. As, as of course, the more unity in an eldership, the better. And uh, sure. there's, a, there's enough things to get under your skin in, in any eldership with regard to uh, all sorts of different practical and uh, of the uh, doctrinal decisions that need to be made without having to, that big difference there too. But I, at the same time, I'm not going to say it's wrong or it's impossible. Yeah. And I think, I think it actually uh, is a helpful argument for having a robust confession as your uh, confession of faith for your church, such as the 1689 or New Hampshire or something like that. Uh, not that those things, not again, like you even said, uh, they're not necessarily precluding mm -hmm. at least historic pre-mill and post-mill, um, as as potential viewpoints under that confession but um yeah just knowing the more robust of your doctrine that's in your confession the more unity you're going to have at least among the elders so uh, i think that is helpful and important all right amen amen 
Well, all right. It looks like uh, that answers all the questions that came in, which is really great. Uh, I've got a couple of comments in here. Make sure you thank Dr. Waldron for coming on and providing good information uh, for people to be edified for years and decades to come. Let's hope that's the case. Thanks for having uh, Dr. Waldron on. I don't agree with his stance, but always enjoy listening to others that can articulate their view as well. So always good to have a diversity of views and stuff in the in the comments. So I appreciate you guys watching and everyone obviously appreciates having you on. So I'd like to thank you as well, Dr. Waldron. Um, and before you head out, could we, can you tell us where we can find you? Maybe not, I know you're not on much socials, so you have some Facebook accounts and things like that, but um, I know you, like maybe the CBT seminary blog or anything else like that. Sure. that you want to um, yeah. CBTseminary.org, go there and you can find a lot of the media stuff that's coming out. Uh, and, uh, you younger guys will find it easier than I do, I'm sure. <laughs> but but uh, you'll find uh, I do the Confessing the Faith podcast. Yes, I love that. <laughs> uh, and uh, there are a lot of other really helpful uh, podcasts that the guys are putting together now. Uh, uh, I know the, uh, Ron Miller's particular pilgrim is popular with a lot of people. And we have some guys in our church that narrate Puritan literature, and you'll find some of that stuff on there. So, but cbtseminary.org. Um, you can also audit our classes for a small fee every month. And uh, uh, I just got done uh, teaching our, our basic eschatology class again, which is uh, in which I dealt with uh, primarily introductory historical and structural considerations. I hope to do a uh, uh, a more advanced class in the next year or two mm -hmm. called Special Questions, uh, which takes up a lot of the questions and more that are in End Times Made Simple in its third part. Anyway, so that's where you can find me. And, you know, it's been really a great, Greg, talk with you again and talking to you. Uh, uh, I've talked to the folks that listen on your podcast. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I was so upset that I did, wasn't able to get up there for that, uh, the Doctrine of Lost Things class this past month. But uh, yeah. I'll get up there soon, I'm sure. I'm trying to make it work, you know, between one of T4G and April. So I will be up there in that general yeah. vicinity, at least. Yeah. Uh, and some other There's a like visit that. on Sunday or something. If you can. That would be great. Yeah. I have so many people that like that I know in Louisville and Owensboro now, too, that want to talk to me. And I'm like, I want to go. <laughs> so yeah. it'll be good. It'll be a good time. Well, all right. Uh, if you don't mind, would you would you pray for us as we end this evening? Father, the word of God says that the entrance of your word gives light. And we ask that your word would be our light and guide your people, keep them from error and distraction, lead them in the path of, 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 of practical Christianity, help them to be followers of the way, and Lord, we do come to you to thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, everybody, thank you for watching. I really appreciate you hanging out and asking questions. Dr. Waldron, thank you once again. Um, if you would hang around for just a couple of seconds after I end the broadcast for some final details, and that will be it. But guys, again, thanks for watching, and we'll catch you in the next episode. Uh, the next one should be with uh, John English Lee, and we'll be talking about the Sabbath, and I am very excited about that uh, with all the conversations that I've been having around that lately. So thanks, Dr. Waldron. Thank you guys for watching. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.